Go ahead to Romans chapter 4. And I want to begin reading this morning at verse 13 and read through to the end of the chapter. It really continues on from what Paul has been arguing in terms of faith, the centrality of faith, and using Abraham as that illustration. And so beginning in verse 13, he writes this, For the promise to Abraham, or to his descendants, that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. For the law brings about wrath, but where there's no law, there's no violation. For this reason, it's by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, even as it is written, a father of many nations have I made you. In the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. In hope against hope he believed, so that he might become a father of many nations, according to which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able to perform. Therefore, it was also credited him as righteousness. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. Let's pray together. Lord, uh, teach us this morning, uh, increase our faith, and our understanding of the promise of grace and the certainty of our hope. And Lord, I pray that we would be encouraged in heart this morning. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. There's a, a sentence, as short as it is, uh, it's really only two words, that when uttered in my household, strikes fear in the hearts of my family. Trust me. Trust me. I, I'm not really sure why, uh, but there may be a story. Uh, a number of years ago, when I was, we were in Bermuda, and I was bound and determined that I was going to go sailing on the very last day before we left. And uh, went to a friend's house who had a little sunfish, little sailboat, and uh, convinced Stephen to trust me. Now you need to know there was a small craft warning out. But I was bound and determined. And so sure enough, Stephen trusted me and got in the boat. And we did great until we got into the out a ways away from the dock and went around and the boat went over. And Stephen went over. Uh, and because of the wind and the waves and that particular, it was very difficult to get that boat back up. And so uh, our other son, Tim, and the gentleman who was our friend had to come out in another boat to kind of help us right the boat. Stephen was relieved. He didn't have to get back into the sailboat with me. He got into the other boat and uh, went back to the shore. And, and to this day, um, 
Whenever we're around a boat and, and I look at Stephen and say, trust me, <laughs> he doesn't get in the boat. <laughs> if I were to say his faith, his trust would be vindicated or ratified if the day comes when he gets in the boat. And I can give him all the promises and all the assurances, but until he gets in the boat, then he believes the promise. Here in the book of Romans, the idea of the promise is, is very, very important. If you remember way back in, in chapter 1, in fact, right at the opening statement, Paul says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called and his apostle, set apart for the gospel, which he promised beforehand. And so this idea of a promise is very important to Paul throughout the book of Romans, and, and it is here in chapter 4. This promise that he is centered in is the promise to Abraham. Back in Genesis chapter 15 and 17, we'll see, very significant that God had promised Abraham that he would make of him a great nation. Not just one nation, but he would be the father of many nations. And it is through the seed of Abraham that the nations, the world, will be blessed. And so Paul is now using that promise to Abraham and Abraham's response to it to try to resolve an issue that was characteristic in the early church. Sometimes it's very hard for us to understand. Um, we think in terms of Christians. Yeah, the, the church is Christianity. Uh, we need to remember that uh, when the church was birthed, there was no Christianity, as we might call it. The church, the gospel, was preached to Jews. And, uh, and it was a continuation of the Old Testament promises. See, Romans chapter 1. And so, uh, for example, the, the Apostle Paul didn't convert from Judaism to Christianity. So that, that's a wrong way for us to think about that. Uh, the Apostle Paul was Jewish, who came to understand that the Jewish scriptures were being fulfilled in the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. So he didn't convert to Christianity. There was no... Christianity is such. Christianity then develops. They were first called Christians at Antioch. There's now expanding outside of the Jewish people. And so the Jewish people had a very uh, self-centered, ethno-centered view of the gospel and of the promise to Abraham, uh, that, uh, that everything was happening or would happen in the life and the context of the Jew and the promise to the Jews. And so when Gentiles become followers of Jesus, the Messiah, the, the Jews say, well, if you want to be part of the real promise, if you want to be part of the covenant of blessing, then you have to follow the law and you have to be circumcised. And that really sets up a, 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 a difficult problem in the life of the early church. I mean, Acts chapter 15, Jerusalem Council, they're wrestling with that. Uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians, they're wrestling with that. And, and Paul is wrestling with that here in Romans. The, the church in Rome, remember, uh, was Jewish, but the Jews had been exiled, and, and now there were Gentiles, the Jews have come back, and there, there's, there's some tension. And so Paul is resolving this tension by coming back to Abraham. 
and the idea of the promise. And the opening part of chapter 4, he laid the case that when Abraham believed God, when he believed that promise in Genesis chapter 15, uh, he hadn't been circumcised. He wasn't following the law. There wasn't any law to follow. And so his relationship, his covenant relationship with God, his, his standing, his right standing with God is, is by faith. And so now he's going to continue that with this idea of the promise. This promise, he says, is necessitated by faith. It is, you have to understand, he says, that this promise to Abraham demonstrates faith. So in the opening part, verse 13 and 14, and he says that the promise to Abraham to his descendants that he would be an heir uh, of the world was not through the law. It, it, that promise came before there was the law and before there was the right of circumcision. So even in Genesis 15, where he had believed God. Genesis 17, that covenant is elaborated on, and it is the end of chapter 17 that then the circumcision seals that covenant. But the covenant is entered into. The promise is received, not while Abraham is following the law, equivalent circumcision, but is still by faith. And so he says, look, it didn't, that promise that he would be heir of the world was not through the righteousness of faith, or the, not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If those who are of the law are heirs, then faith is made void. Now, what does he mean by that? He says, well, if you're, that promise comes by the law, then there's no faith. There's no need for faith. He's setting up the order that Abraham believed before the law. He says, but listen, if people are fulfilled, the Jewish people who think now that they are the recipients of that promise and by keeping the law, then faith has no part in it. But we know that Abraham, our father, he says, entered into that promise by faith. So if those who are of the law are the heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. The promise becomes inoperative because Abraham wasn't keeping the law. Here's, here it is. Abraham, through you, I'm going to bless the nations and you will have an inheritance of nations those nations, you'll be the father of nations. You'll have the inheritance of the world. Abraham, that's my promise to you. Abraham is not keeping the law. So if you are now saying, well, wait a minute, I'm Jewish, and we get that promise by keeping the law, he said, then Abraham really isn't your father at all. Because Abraham received that promise by faith, not by law. So there's no promise. It is only applicable to those, if it is only applicable to those who have the law, then Abraham didn't qualify. And you are a descendant of Abraham, then you don't qualify either. The purpose of the law was not to bring the promise. The purpose of the law doesn't bring the promise, instead brings wrath. And, and so in those opening statements, he says, look, about this promise, it is building on what he has said to the first 12 verses. Look, it's got to be by faith. Because Abraham became a recipient of the promise by faith. And then in this longer section, beginning in, in verse 16, he says the promise is guaranteed by grace. It's by grace. 
He says, for this reason then, it's by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not just to those of the law, not just to the Jewish people, but to all who are the descendants of Abraham and be a member because Abraham, you're going to have descendants of many nations outside of the Jews. And so not only to those of the law, but to those of the faith of Abraham, who's the father of us all. And then he quotes from Genesis 17. And he says, in the presence of him whom he believed. That's God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which doesn't exist. So go back to Genesis chapter 17. Because beginning in Genesis 17 and, and through Genesis 22 is this story of Abraham's faith. Now, Genesis 15, we said there was the, the promise, the covenant begun, given, and it was reckoned to him as righteous. He believed God. Genesis 17. Now, Abraham was 99 years old. Now, what's significant about that? Well, back in Genesis 16, he was only 80, he was 86, or, okay, uh, and so what you have between Genesis 15 is a promise when Abraham says, look, the only person I have to give my inheritance to is this servant, Eliezer. No, no, it's not going to be Eliezer. You're going to have a son. Genesis 16. See, I'm old, and Sarah is barren. Sarah is unable to have children. And so they come up with the plan to have a child through Hagar. And so is that really by faith? Well, they think they're acting out of faith. But it's not what God has for them. So between 86 and now 99, 13 years, they're waiting. By the way, did you notice something about the couples that were down here? Okay. How, how old are you guys? Yeah. yeah. Chris and Heather, yeah, probably in their early 30s. Aren't you? Early 30s? Yeah. I didn't see anybody down here who was 50. Now, next hour we'll be close. Rick Bush will be down here. <laughs> but but his are adopted. Hey, 99 years old. Okay, now you got to think about it. Not, okay. Think of your grandparents. Great grandparents. Abraham is 99 years old, and the Lord appears to him and says, I am God Almighty, El Shaddai. Walk before me, be blameless, and I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. And he falls on his face, and he says, wow. And God talks to him. As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but you shall be called Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. And that's what Paul is alluding to. Okay. Now he's 99. And, and so Abraham said, well, how could this be? Um, I, I'm, I'm this old, and Sarah, she's not as old as I am, but she's close. And not only is she old, but she's been barren. She can't have children. Verse 18. And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God said, No, no, no. Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. Now, I'll take care of Ishmael, he says, but Ishmael is not the son of promise. Sarah's going to have a child. And you say, Huh. Abraham believed God, right? 
You realize how hard it was for Abraham to believe God, not only for himself, but for Sarah. And he's been waiting already 13 years, trying to figure this out for himself. Abraham laughed when God told him. In chapter 18, when the visitors come before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Sarah overhears them in the, te in the conversation and that she's going to have a child, and she laughs. Chapter 19 is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Chapter 20 is a repeat performance, an encore performance by Abraham and how great Abraham's faith is. He says, we go down to Abimelech, you tell Abimelech you're my sister. Boy, that's a real trophy of faith, isn't it? But this is quite a year we're going to see that he has. It's quite a year of testing. And then chapter 21. And the Lord took note of Sarah as he had said. The Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. The appointed time which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old as God had commanded him. Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I've borne him a son in his old age. God fulfilled his promise. Now, when I say it's of grace, and Paul says this promise of the son has to be by grace, It is by grace to both Jews and to Gentiles. See, it's not just to the Jews, it's to both, because it's the father of many nations. But grace then means that this promise that is given, and the promise of the gospel, the promise of the blessing, it's extended to all who believe, that, that this grace is not limited to a, a particular group of people. It's now open to all of the descendants of Abraham, those who are followers of Abraham by faith, that is in the promise. Both Jews and Gentiles. But it's also of grace because it originates with God and is accomplished by God. And so thinking back to what Paul has been arguing in terms of the gospel, this good news that we've believed in the work of Christ, the promise of Christ, and our salvation, our deliverance, and our right standing with God, and, and the God being satisfied, and all of those things that we've been talking about through Romans 3. He says, listen, you need to understand that this deliverance, this atonement, that this salvation which you have, it originates with God. And it's accomplished by God. Just as Abraham, in that promise, the promise of a son through whom the nations would be blessed, that promise originated with God. And it was accomplished by God. Abraham didn't earn that. Abraham couldn't initiate that. Abraham couldn't accomplish that. Because of his age and because Sarah's barren. And so this message, he said, of the gospel to you Jews, if you think that this is because you... you earned this? You're a part of this relationship with God because you earned it? No. Because Abraham didn't. It was by grace. And he battled to this. This was a struggle. That's why in hope against hope he believed. 
that there, there was no merit, there was nothing in and of himself that could produce that promise. That he could become the father of many nations. And then when he says, without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, as good as dead, and in the deadness of Sarah's womb. <coughs> Yet with respect to the promise of God, he didn't waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able to perform it. Listen, when I say the promise is guaranteed by grace, and we say, look, it begins with God, it's accomplished by God, the, the grace is a demonstration of that, but it's guaranteed by grace. So how is that guaranteed? Because it's all on God's shoulders. See? When it's all by grace, then the guarantee that that promise is going to be realized is because of the character of God. That's why some of the things we sang earlier today, I, some of those things about who God is, our salvation by grace. Some, yeah, it's a gift, it's a gift, it's a gift. Do we understand that because it's a gift from God, that it's a gift that can never be rescinded. It's a gift that can never be non-satisfactory. That it's a gift that is absolutely guaranteed to do what God said he would do because God's character, God's name is at stake. When it's all of grace, when it's all of God, it can't fail. Isn't that great? See, do you understand why grace is so amazing? Why it's so wonderful? Because grace demands that it be fulfilled by the character and the name of God. And that's what Abraham was counting on. Listen, Abraham, yeah, it says he was strong in his faith, that he, he grew strong, he didn't waver. But we said he struggled. And it was tested. The ultimate test comes in chapter 22. In chapter 22, after Isaac's birth, after he's weaned, so Isaac is a little boy. And God says, okay, take your son, your only son, and I want you to take him up on Mount Moriah, and I want you to sacrifice him. I'm glad that chapter opens. Now God tested Abraham. And Abraham did it. Abraham took Isaac up to the mountain and was ready to sacrifice him, remember? Sam, if you got an email from God today to say, take Jay, okay, down to Mount Adams and go ahead and sacrifice him, how willing would you be to do that? Not very, yeah. Hey, I'm there, okay? Can you imagine if you waited for 99 years for a son <coughs> through Sarah and now go take that son? The writer of the Hebrews helps us understand that. He says, you know what? He believed God would either stop him or God would raise Isaac from the dead. What is he saying? I believe God's promise to the point where I will trust him even at the taking of Isaac's life because I know that Isaac is the son of promise and that through Isaac's descendants, and he doesn't have any yet, are going to come the promises that God has given me. He was that sure. 
He said, and if I follow through on this, God has to raise him from the dead. That process took time. And, but he was basing that in God's character and God's grace. And so the promise is, necessitates faith, and, but it's guaranteed by grace. But Paul goes one more step. And he says, listen, this promise is vindicated by the resurrection. It, he says, look, God, God was able to do it. In verse 22, it was also credited to him as righteousness. He's pulling from chapter 15. He says, look, this idea of reckon to him as righteousness now has not that he's acquitted from sin. This has the idea, reckon as righteousness here, as his faith is now justified. See? His faith is vindicated. It's like, Stephen, get in the boat. I'll get in the boat, Dad. I trust you. See? But it wasn't just for him. This is instructive for us, too. Who also believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. What is he saying? Our faith in the promise of God, our faith in, in what Jesus has done as fulfilling that promise as Messiah, as King, as Son of God, and as Savior, as Redeemer, as our atonement for sin. Jesus, he said, our faith in God and accomplishing that through Jesus is vindicated by the reality of resurrection. That the resurrection of Jesus didn't just validate Christ, that resurrection also validates our faith in Christ. Isaiah 53, and, and actually the, the last, verse 25, he was delivered over because of our transgressions, was raised because of our justification, I think comes from Isaiah 53. But it, it seems to be maybe a creedal statement. There are two parallel lines. Okay, that, that are, are, are structured in such a way that it seems to pull from Isaiah 53. This is what the church believed, and maybe some. But let me tie another passage in here, okay? Remember, we haven't got there yet, but we've talked about Romans 8 often. Romans 8, Paul says, look, you can... Be absolutely certain that the one God predestined, God called. The one who God called, he justified. And the one he justified, he glorified. Now, glorified hasn't happened yet. But he puts it into the tense that it, like it has. It's that certain. And we're going to be conformed to the image of his son. That's resurrection. And then he says... For if God did not spare his own son, you know where he's pulling that from? Genesis 22, where God says to Abraham, take your son, take your only son, take that son, the son whom you love, take that son and put him to death. If God did not spare his own son, but offered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? And the all things there primarily says, look, he's going to fulfill his promises of glory, of resurrection. The resurrection of Christ guarantees our resurrection. It vindicates our faith in Christ. God will fulfill his promises. See, what did we sing a little earlier? I made note of it. And when I reach the final day, he will not leave me in the grave, but I will rise. He will call me home. The Lord is my salvation. See? How can you sing that with certainty? 
because you believe the promise of God and your resurrection is going to vindicate your faith. Friends may scoff at you now. Family may chuckle at you now. But in the day of resurrection, your faith will be fully vindicated. Abraham's faith was vindicated. So listen. Our relationship with God, which apart from Christ, we don't have one. That, but that relationship is entered into by faith. That's what Paul's been arguing. It, it, it's guaranteed by the character of God. The grace of that gift is guaranteed by the character of God and vindicated even by the resurrection of Christ. This, our faith is going to be tested. It's going to be tested. Abraham's was. But God will keep his promise. If you struggle with whether or not God will keep his promise, and there are times in our life where we will struggle with our faith. Abraham did. Then take a look back on the calendar to April 1st this year. You know what April 1st was this year? Not April Fool's Day. You know what April 1st was this year? Resurrection Day. And every year we celebrate a Resurrection Day. Every Sunday we celebrate the truth and the reality of the resurrection. When you're struggling with your faith, you look back to the resurrection as the certainty that God will fulfill his promises. In the end of chapter 8 of Romans, Paul's conclusion then is, look, the challenges are going to come, but I believe that neither height nor de or, or depth or breadth or life or death or sword or famine or whatever it is, no matter what the circumstances of your life, there's absolutely nothing that can separate you from the love of God that is the faithful execution of his promises. There's nothing that can thwart God from fulfilling his promises, his love for you, that blessing, that relationship. There's nothing. He will faithfully fulfill it no matter what the challenge is you're facing. He will vindicate your faith. Next week we'll come back and pick up chapter 5 because it's like, wow, if, if God has done all this, wow, it isn't over yet. I mean, we, we are going to have peace with God. And we're going to talk about our, our grace and our standing and our hope and our glory. And wow, because we stand in that promise of God.